Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 30th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, wasting yet another opportunity to show vision. The Anchorage Daily News editorial board overlooks the middle on the PFD issue. Second, we look at the governor's nomination of Josh Revac to the vacant Senate seat, his statement on the special session, and what we think all that means about where we are headed on the PFD. And third, amidst all the static, we talk about whether the U will ever be able to get it right. And now, let's join Michael. Let's jump into this with uh, the weekly top three, and we're going to start off uh, with a piece that I touched on yesterday, and uh, and I got to tell you, I have been talking about this uh, quite frequently here over the last few months, and the piece is an opinion piece. It's an editorial by the board at the Anchorage Daily News, and uh, it is The War for the Soul of the Alaska Republican Party is the title of the piece. And it jumps to some seriously wrong conclusions, but I think it does bring up the fact that we have a problem with a group divided, and uh, you're you're going to talk about uh, you know how the issue how how they have the issue wrong. Well, I, I have read this piece several times. It's and it's and it's provoked different reactions uh, on different readings. Um, I guess after a couple of days of sort of sort of living with it. I've got two reactions. One, it's it is it, and and for readers who haven't or for listeners who haven't read it, it's it's an editorial in the Anchorage Daily News that I think is is an important read. Um, but but there's there's two things about it that I think I really finally sort of settle on. One is it's fairly good reporting in the sense of uh, in the sense of describing. Uh, the current rift in the Republican Party, deep rift in the Republican Party, uh, between those who want to save the PFD as Governor Hammond established it and those who want to cut the PFD, tax the PFD, uh, and convert money to uh, to the state that otherwise, by statute, goes to the citizens of Alaska. Um, and it's a it, and and it's a fairly good good article. I mean, it's a fairly good piece on reporting that deep rift and reporting on those two sides. I mean, as you and I have talked about on the show, I think the side that wants to tax Alaskans, wants to tax the PFD, is basically the top 20%. Right. And basic and basically what they're trying to do is the top, it top the, the portion of the Republican Party that's, that's in the top 20% economically in the state. And basically what they're trying to do is pick a tax that doesn't affect them uh, and shoves the burden off on somebody else. And using a PFD tax because of the unique way PFD set up, using a PFD tax, it, it does that entirely. I mean, the top 20% pay a trivia, trivial amount of money. Non-residents pay zero. The bulk of the tax falls on middle and lower income uh, Alaska families. And so that's one side of the Republican Party. The other side of the Republican Party is, is the remaining 80% that says, hey, don't shove that cost off on us. This is money owed us, uh, just like any income, just like any investment income, just like your trust funds, top 20%. This is money that's owed. This is our trust fund. Uh, uh, don't tax our trust fund. And so it's, it, uh, the, 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 the editorial does a good job capturing those two sides. What the editorial does not do, and this is what, this is what 
should distinguish editorials from reporting, from news reports. What the editorial does not do is sort of look through that and say, hey, what are we missing? Um, and what they're missing is the middle. Uh, they, they, they've, they've, they've captured the two extremes. They've captured the, the top 20% tax the PFD uh, and, the, and the other side uh, going, don't take our PFD. And by the way, cut government spending, cut all that stuff that, that everybody uh, that, 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 that's causing you to tax, cut all that stuff and, and, and cut it down to you know, basically zero uh, so that we can have our PFD. It, they're missing the middle. And the middle is this. The middle is, is, is facing reality that not even the governor's initial budget was able to cut spending down to the level uh, where there wasn't a required some required contribution by Alaska citizens. That that after the first and second vetoes, there weren't 16 Republicans in the legislature that would support the governor's cuts, uh, support even the governor's initial cuts that weren't enough to get down to 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 to, to no contribution. That there weren't 16 legislators to support even that level. Uh, of cuts, and and so we end up with another billion dollar, roughly billion dollar deficit uh, uh, in state spending as a result of that. That 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 there's not support for that extreme of cutting spending down to the level uh, where there's no contribution required uh, by uh, by Alaskans, and 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 so the editorial is missing that middle. It's missing the middle where uh, there's not enough support to cut spending. But it's wrong. Uh, it's it's also wrong to just tax middle and lower income Alaska families, and the editorial doesn't delve into that and say, "What are we missing here? What, right. what what's the solution to this issue yeah. that doesn't adopt one of these extremes?" And I think and and I think so as an editorial, it fails um, uh, in 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 sort of the the essential obligation of an editorial to cut through the cut through the news and to and to identify. The piece that's missing and 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 the way forward. Well, and I think it not only does that. I mean, not only does it fail to classify and quantify the middle. It just it, it's it's so obvious. Even in some of the verbiage that they use when they try and talk about this, this is not really even. A, I understand it's an opinion piece, so don't don't get me wrong. But you could see just the slant on it from the from the very beginning, where they talk about the the two different sides. You know. Uh, on the one side, you've got the, the group that has uh, veteran legislators who favor cuts, albeit not nearly so many or so quickly as the governor, and who are willing to reduce the dividend in order to preserve an Alaska that looks more like the one we have today with regard to the services the state offers. The second is a PFD diehard caucus willing to put the state's annual payments ahead of almost all else that is the strongest in the Matsu parts of the Kenai and pockets in Anchorage. So, I mean, you could see if just, just the way that they phrase this and that they frame it, you could see, of course, obviously where they lay. But I just want to take a quick, you know, cut at that first thing. You know, these veteran legislators who want to do these things and preserve an Alaska that looks more like the one we have today with regards to the services the state offers. You mean the one that has given us the Alaska, the Alaska that we cannot afford without some other form of income or revenue to the state to make it happen, where we're spending well beyond our means, that's the Alaska they're looking to preserve? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the the the, 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 the editorial board and, and, and the editorial writer, the person who writes these editorials, clearly, uh, I mean, if you just follow uh, follow those people, I mean, it's clearly a group that, that favors PFD cuts, clearly favors um, uh, 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 cutting the cut, uh, taxing the PFD in order to support state spending, forcing the uh, pushing the burden to middle and lower income Alaska families. Uh, that's that's clearly where they favor. And yes, that's coming through. That's coming through very clearly uh, in the in the editorial. I I agree. It's slanted uh, in in that way. But taking but but looking at it deeper, I mean, it's not only slanted in that way. It's just missing what I think is increasingly becoming an obvious an obvious solution here, and the solution is we're not going to get spending cut. We need to wake up to that fact. You and I have been through this over and over. There's one program that we spent you know uh, 40 minutes in detail going through one of my spreadsheets talking about that. Cuts aren't going to be deep enough uh, to 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 bring us back, especially with oil prices falling away. Again, 
uh, cuts aren't going to be deep, deep enough to, to, to bring spending down to a, a point where we don't need taxation. We do. We are going to need some contribution from Alaska citizens toward toward the cost of government. And and the question is how best to do that. Um, and yes, the, the editorial slants toward uh, tax the PFD. It's it's frankly the easiest thing for the state to do. The money's running through their fingers anyway, so they just grab a bunch a bunch of it as it's going through their fingers and don't let and don't let it through. They just divert it to the state. Uh, grab the PFD as it's going through and uh, and fund the state that way. But but they're just they're missing and 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 the top 20 percent continually misses. What, what that's doing. I mean, it's pushing the tax to middle and lower income Alaska families. Right. It's push, putting the burden on, on lower middle income Alaska families. So your assertion is, of course, to take a look at a broader base tax. And, of course, we have to discuss the efficacy of a flat tax being the most equitable across all income uh, uh, income ranges and everything else, 3%, 4%, and that that would fund government, which, of course, raises howls from a lot of the listeners who say, no, we're not done cutting. I mean, we're not done taking government back to where it is. But if we don't draft this conversation, if we don't steer it, they could just run us right over with it when it finally, when they do finally come to the quote unquote realization. Yeah, I've I've grown a little weary. You can see that on my comments on Facebook. I've grown a little weary of of people who say cut, cut, cut. We haven't cut for four years. We've had four years of taxes. What does it take to wake you up to the fact? That, that we're not going to cut you we elected a governor who even in his initial budget couldn't cut enough right to get to get to get spending down uh, to match revenues he was 400 million short by the time we go through the first and second round of vetoes by the time you know the republicans fall off supporting him we're at back at a billion dollar deficit 25 percent of our spending is being supported by uh, uh pfd taxes um we, we're not we're not going to cut enough um, and so it's time really to face up to that. Four years is enough. It's time to face up to that. And a flat tax has a lot of a lot of, of fairness built into it, but it also has one advantage that people that people continually overlook, which is that it's it gives everybody the same uh, 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 same participation in the game everybody pays the same tax rate it creates an incentive for everybody to try to get spending down because if you get spending down your taxes go down and and no longer are we pushing that like pfd cuts do pushing that off on middle and lower income alaska families the top 20 percent is sharing that in, in that as well right. and i it, we've, we've talked about this before but i tell you it's a different thing kathy giesel uh natasha von emhoff bert stedman uh, 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 Gary Stevens, John Coghill are going to have a different reaction when they and their social class, they and their donor class, have to pay taxes. They're going to say, "Wait, we're spending three hundred million dollars on the university. We don't, we don't need to be spending three hundred million dollars on the university." Right. The top twenty percent is going to get in the game of 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 pushing spending down. Right now, they aren't. They don't care. Because they've pushed the burden off on middle and lower income Alaska families. So a flat tax, one approach to this, a flat tax, has the effect of spreading that burden also to, not disproportionately, not higher than everybody else, but spreading that burden to the top 20%, getting their head in the game as well, so that they focus as well on, on getting spending down. Let me see here what some of the comments in the chat room. Brad is right. Focusing only on the outliers denies the reality of the middle. The latter who understand, like some of the bottom 80% that the PFDs were not meant to be appropriations that compete with other state services. It's the 20% uh, plus some others who have dominated the conversation, which has led to the false narrative of PFD versus state services. And uh, I think that's 100% correct. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, the top 20% is looking after themselves. You can't, you, you can't argue with that. But, but you can argue with the result. The result is the top 20% is adopting a tax scheme where they don't pay, they pay a trivial amount, non-residents pay nothing, and they're shoving all of the responsibility off uh, on middle and lower income Alaskans' families. The, the ADN has never recognized that. There's one article that Nat Hertz did back in 2017 that's the, that, that was a follow-up to a study done by ITIP, the Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy, 
uh, that that focused on that on the distributional aspects of PFD cuts. Nat Hertz did an article that 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 focused on that and and did that. But that's 2017. That's two years ago, <clears throat> right. uh, and and they really haven't haven't done another story on that since. This editorial just, as I say, I've read it several times. I keep going back and forth. It just irritates me that 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 they're you know it, it's on the one hand, on the other hand, um, it, but there's this huge middle. Uh, that that nobody that they're not talking about, nobody's talking about. We're talking about, but nobody else is talking about in the media uh, where the solution lies. Um, and and it's just it's frustrating uh, to 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 see that continually displayed in terms of the extremes and not in the middle. Ron Gillum says in the chat room, the bottom line is we need opponents for all of the lawbreakers. And I would argue that we need opponents for every incumbent in office, regardless of whether they are quote-unquote good or quote-unquote bad. It's the one thing that we need. It helps keep all of our it helps keep all of our incumbents uh, honest, I mean, and on track and on board. I mean, Ron, of all people, understands that from what he, you know, what happened in his race uh, when he ran for the Senate in the primary. I mean, we've got to have some challengers here. Yeah, I, I mean— some people would say that let's not challenge the ones who who favor cuts only, and and I, I have some, some uh, uh, sympathy with that. But the problem is the cuts only people are being unrealistic. Four years we've had PFD taxes. Four years the governor didn't even propose a cuts only budget. A cuts only budget that succeed, succeeded in in balancing revenue and spending, and after and after we went through these two veto rounds, we found out there weren't even 16 in the legislature who, when push came to shove, were willing to do that, uh, were willing to, to stand up for cuts only. So it's great to, cut, to talk about it, but what you're really doing when you talk about cuts only is you're enabling, the you're, you're, you're taking yourself off the field in terms of talking about the middle, and you're enabling the top twenty percent to continue well, to put to push PFD cuts because because the cut the, the nobody's offering another alternative that that's better. What do you it's, say? It's either it's either cuts only or 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 tax the PFD. What what do you say to people that say you know I mean the the cuts only crowd? Uh, I mean yeah we've had four years to cut but they have been in the super m minority at this point. What if we were able to put? you know, 20 people in there that were cuts only crowd, then do you think we could get it done? Because again, this isn't just a one man or one woman job. It's not just the administration. It's not just one legislator. I mean, it takes a crowd to do it. I mean, what, what say you then? I, I don't think we elect 20. I mean, let's focus on Sarah Rasmussen for a second, right? We elected Sarah Rasmussen in, in West Anchorage, thought she was going to be the one she, thought she was part of the cuts only crowd. Um, but when push, Push came to shove. She was one of the of the of the Republicans that backed off um, and said, "No, I'm not prepared to go total cuts only. We've got to save certain certain elements of of, of spending." She did it in the capital budget, and she did it again uh, in the operating budget. You, you're, it's nice to talk about getting 20 cuts only, but 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 we don't we don't have it. We don't have 16 now, and even the ones that you think. Are gonna are gonna stand up for cuts only when push comes to shove they don't the governor didn't I mean I mean he was 400 million dollars short in his initial budget on on having a cuts only uh, 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 budget so it's just I, I yeah yeah in theory you know in theory it'd be great to have Christmas every day but in, <laughs> and and in theory it would be great to, to have cuts only it's not gonna happen four years is telling us it's not gonna happen and and all we're doing by continuing down this cuts only road is enabling those who say well there isn't another alternative out there so let's cut the pfd another year let's cut the pfd another year let's cut the got pfd it. another got year it. Yep. flat tax says joseph flat tax isn't going to bring back a full pfd if you think that's how this is going to work i've got a bridge to sell you who goes on to say there's not enough population to fill that gap, flat tax is a minuscule amount of money in comparison to the deficit. Brad, what say you? Oh no, flat tax. Flat tax is actually fairly easy. You take you take the amount of the deficit, you divide it by uh, adjusted gross income in the state, which is about 25 billion. 
Uh, you gross that up for non-resident income, which is about another 10%, so another 2.5. You you're about at 27.5 billion. Um, if you've got a one billion dollar, uh, a one billion deficit, and you got a 25.7 uh, billion uh, base, that's about a 4% flat tax. It's 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 fairly easy to do. It's not. I mean, people think about people think about their own income. They don't think about the total income base in the state, which is fairly big uh, for a state this size. So. Now it's it's it, that's uh, flat tax is easy to implement. Uh, it's a fairly uh, 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 accomplishable uh, uh, percentage uh, in terms of income, and it will create the incentives uh, for uh, Alaska for the top twenty percent to push back uh, on on government spending. Those incentives don't exist now. William asks, uh, this is kind of down in the weeds. He says, would there be an exemption for miners under your flat tax proposal? No. No, no. Uh, miners have income. <laughs> I mean, they, they have they have PFD income, and and they need to contribute uh, as well. Now, you know, miners who only have the PFD as income would have a a, a a very small contribution to make. But all Alaskans need to be in this game. We start exempting people. We start creating classes that don't have to face up uh, to uh, to 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 the reality that we're in. Uh, and and we, we we've created people who then you know want uh, want more government spending because they don't have to pay for it. So right. no, everybody that has income in Alaska contributes. And your recommendation, of course, is also have it be an adjusted gross income where it includes like some investment incomes and other things that traditionally have been excluded from flat taxes in the past. Yes, um, uh, there are all sorts of flat taxes. There are seven states that have flat tax right now. Uh, some of them have exemptions, some of them don't. Some of them have different sort of ways that they go about doing it. Uh, we just we need to get everybody in the game. Alaska is in, a, is in the situation it's in because citizens haven't had to face up to uh, to the reality of, of paying for their government. Uh, and we need to get everybody's head in the game of, of that situation so that we all can push together to, to, to lower spending. Um, yeah, there's there there are different types of flat taxes. My approach is to get is to use one that gets everybody's head in the game. Well, and of course, that was Hammond's argument back in the day: is that he had always recommended keeping the income tax simply because it kept Alaskans, it kept skin in the game, so to speak, for Alaskans. And uh, and we have not had that skin in the game for the last twenty five years. Uh, we just we have not had any uh, real pain being felt by what we're doing, and uh, and this is where we're at because of it. So it's more like 40 years. Yeah, right? it is 40 it, years. Yeah. I was just saying it's, it's been a little longer. I'm getting old, Brad. Just leave me, leave me be. All right. Just leave me be. Somebody told me the other day to take, take whatever time you thought it was and double it. So that sort of works in that situation. That works out just right. Cause that was just about right there. Brad Keithley, Alaska's for sustainable budgets. Uh, we're running out of time, Brad. Uh, Got to give me 15 seconds of uh, battle plan. What do we do? I think there's a way forward. But the way forward is not at the extremes. It's not at the extreme of cut the, of, of shove the burden off on middle and lower income Alaskans or at the extreme of cuts only. Both of those are the wrong way, unrealistic way to go. We need to start finding the middle. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Uh, we could probably go on about this specific issue all day long, uh, but we need to kind of tease up into the next one, which, of course, is the appointment now of Josh Revac. And the special session, you want to tease into it here, Brad, before we take a quick break? Well, I think I think this divide that we just talked about uh, in the first segment uh, bleeds over into the second segment. Uh, the governor has said, has tried with Laddie Shaw and now with Josh Revac, to appoint a Republican uh, who's, who's been elected in that district. Uh, Laddie Shaw was the, is the state representative from one part of the district. Josh Revac is now the state representative from the other part of the district. The, the Senate Republican said they want somebody uh, who reflects the, the six who voted against Laddie Shaw says they want somebody who reflects the district. Well, he's appointed the two representatives <laughs> that, that were elected from the district. Right. So we'll, we'll see how, uh, we'll see how uh, the, uh, the, the six that voted against Laddie Shaw react to, to Revac. Continuing on now with Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're working on two of his weekly top three. Number two is the discussion of Josh Revac as the new appointee for the Senate M seat. And uh, the special session, where are we headed on the PFD from here, Brad? Well, 
it's it's great that the governor appointed Revac. I mean, it's the other elected representative from from the district. Um, and I think that's that's an appropriate thing to do. The Senate Republicans, those who voted against Laddie Shaw, said they want we, they want somebody that represents the district. So the governor is giving them the other person who's actually been elected from the district uh, uh, to see if they want to adopt that. I, the, the the common wisdom out there is is the the same six that voted down Laddie Shaw will vote down Josh Revac for the exactly the same reason Revac is supports the law. Uh, and supports uh, the PFD uh, that's that's currently on the on the statute books, and and even more importantly, uh, I think the Senate's going to take the Senate Republican Senate leadership is going to take its own sweet time uh, calling the the Republicans together, Senate Republicans together. One article I read or one thing I heard somebody say uh, in one of my conversations was the Senate Republicans likely won't meet even until the beginning of November uh, uh, to, to interview and decide on uh, uh, Josh and then turn him down. So that really leaves, there, there's really no appetite among the among legislators to go back to special session. There's really no consensus around what they would do if they went into special session to be 30 days of, of churning um, there's really no movement uh, among the existing legislators to, to come to some sort of resolution uh, of the PFD issue, and that's why we saw Laddie rejected. It's why we likely will see Josh rejected after after a fairly long delay, um, and 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 I think that leads to to no special session. I think it leads us into the next session. Interestingly enough, with still a vacancy in the Senate M seat, there may be a vacancy all the way through the next session. Um, and with uh, and with uh, uh, jo Josh and Laddie still in the House, um, and and sort of the same issue still churning through uh, the legislature uh, next session. Frankly, where I think that leads us on the PFD is we had a PFD cut this year. We're going to have another PFD cut next year. If we can't if if, if we can't come to if we can't find a way. To get to the middle on this issue, if we can't find a way to get off the two extremes, uh, then the legislature is going to churn through the budget next year. Uh, the, bu the governor's not going to propose a cuts-only budget. Uh, the legislature is going to churn through the budget next year, say, "Oh, we wish we didn't have to do this, uh, but we're going to cut the PFD again," um, and that's how we're going to go into the 2020 election. Well, and 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 again, that's my fear as well. And of course, with the changes in the administration, uh, the departure of Don Arduin and others, I feel like the governor's uh, budget will probably be nowhere near what this year's budget was to begin with. And that just puts us again further on the road of larger and greater spending anyway. And until people have a real dog in this fight, and I'm starting to agree with you, uh, on the uh, fact that we need to start maybe leading some kind of charge on this flat tax issue. Uh, I mean, I've been an advocate of if it, if it has to be a tax, make it a flat tax. But I'm starting to get to the point with you uh, as well, uh, where I'm almost in agreement that we need to take this because otherwise not everybody is feeling the pain. The only people feeling the pain are those that are directly affected. That dividend is such a large part of their yearly income. Uh, you know, the, the, the top 20 just doesn't, they just don't feel it. No, no, they've, they've successfully pushed it off on middle and lower income Alaska families. They have, I mean, you'll just look at Natasha, just listen to Natasha, listen to Giesel, listen to Coghill. It's, uh, oh, well, you know, we, we, have to, we have to spend on these programs. We have to spend on these programs. And, and we're just going to grab the PFD uh, to do it uh, because they just don't want to face up to the, they don't want to tax their donor class. Um, and, and they're not, they're not going to make those changes. The, th the thing about, I mean, the thing about cuts only, we, and, and, and I know this is not going to be popular to talk about, but we've got to talk about it because, we, because otherwise we're just going to continue to have PFD cuts. The thing about cuts only, it, look at what the governor's done. He agreed to, to, to cut the, 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 the cut on the university in half to reduce that cut in half to 70 billion from 70 million from uh, initially 130 million. Uh, and then he agreed to phase it in over three years. There is it, it, the university's key to getting a cuts only budget. With that agreement, there is no way, no way that he gets down to a cuts only budget. He wasn't there last year, uh, even with that deep cut to the university. There's no way he gets there this year. And then you look at oil prices. Oil prices are falling away from remember that the that the oil that the projections 
revenue projections are based on $66 oil. We're, we're now looking at the futures market uh, for most of next for most of the remainder of the fiscal year in the 50s. Uh, so oil revenues are falling away from 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 where they need to be to support uh, a cuts only budget um, and and legislators one more time back to the Republican minority. Uh, there weren't 16 who at the end of the day were there ready to go with the governor uh, on maintaining these cuts. They, they backslid uh, uh, into the first veto and then they backslid in the second veto. Uh, and we ended up with about a billion dollar billion dollar cut billion dollar deficit cuts only is nice to talk about uh, uh, but it's just not realistic uh, with where with where we're ending up and every year we spend all of our energy on cuts only the the top 20 percent is just laughing all the way to the bank because they go well you know they sort of they sort of indulge and encourage those who talk cuts only and at the end of the day they don't make the cuts and then they said well the only place we've got to go is the PFD um, and 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 we'll cut the PFD. So we're just we're year by year, and it's four years, folks. Year by year, cuts only is leading to to PFD cuts is leading to PFD taxes. Right. We've got we, we've got to move beyond that. Brad Keithley's our guest. Uh, we talked about the university. Now you just mentioned that, and that leads us into our third of our weekly top three. Where is the University of Alaska headed? This whole accreditation mess is uh, is definitely uh, uh, piqued a lot of interest. And I'll be honest, I had a conversation with somebody who'd worked in university for 15 years and uh, in the, uh, you know, in the uh, in the uh, kind of the bureaucracy and the human administration, human resources side. And the comment was, what a goat rope. There's three different systems. And, it, and they said just the infighting that's going on right now is incredible. And I think that's where this whole accreditation question is coming up right now because of all this infighting. It is, and and the legislature isn't helping. I mean, the accreditation board. I went through this at the University of Virginia. We had a we had an issue at the University of Virginia about five years ago uh, that that had a massive accreditations issue around the failure to uh, failure to achieve shared governance standards. One of the one of the principles of accreditation is you have shared governance. That is that is the faculty has a voice in how the university is governed. Students have a voice in how the university is governed. Uh, and um, and and that voice is legitimate according to the cre- accreditation agencies and needs to be needs to be listened to and taken into account. The university, the, the university management, the president of the university, in trying to respond to these budget cuts, is moving very quickly uh, in trying to get to single accreditation, and 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 he's suppressing some voices, or the university is suppressing some voices uh, of dissent. Uh, along the way to doing that, and I think what the governance, what the what the accreditation uh, committee is doing, or what the, what the accreditation agency is doing, is saying, look, you can't suppress those voices. Under shared governance, you've got to listen to those voices. You've got to provide a forum for those voices. So I think the the, the university needs to needs to create a channel to allow those voices to occur. They still need to get to the right, they still need to be making the right decisions, but they need to create a channel to allow those voices to occur um, and and listen to those voices. Right now, the voices are popping out in very strange ways. There was a a State Senate Affairs Committee meeting uh, last week, hearing last week um, uh, or the week before, that that where the UAA faculty went off on you know on on the fact that UAA wasn't being listened to and there were alternative alternative ways for UAA to 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 continue to exist um, and that that's really the wrong way for those voices to occur they need to occur uh, inside the and I, and I think that led to some of the accreditation agencies' concern that 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 they were these voices were popping out in 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 un un um, inappropriate ways from the standpoint of shared governance. Right. So the university needs to create a channel to allow these voices to occur. Um, and, and you know, it's tough to be President Johnson these days. He's got the pressure of making these cuts. He's got to allow shared governance. But that's part of why he gets paid the bucks he does to, to, to right. do the job. He, right. He's got to figure out a way to do it. Yep, absolutely. And he's got to fight it out with three chancellors who all want to maintain their power when it just it can't happen in the future. And that's part of the problem. Yeah. Uh, William says the uh, university president, Jim Johnson, does not want UAA to go out and be its own separate university, which is what many UAA faculty want now as an alternative to the single consolidated system. 
Yeah, well, uh, Johnson's facing reality, right? You can only have you, you can have one good, solid university on on what the what the legislature is willing it should be appropriating, or you can have three very mediocre <laughs> universities. And Johnson's fulfilling his mission. I mean, I, I I've been a critic of Jim Johnson's in the past, but on this issue, I think he's doing the right thing. Johnson's trying to create the one well, decently funded. Uh, a good, solid university that he can get out of out of the uh, out of the dollars that he's going to be given. Um, I understand why you know the UAA and UAF and UAS all want to maintain their se- maintain their separate identities. We're talking about jobs, and we're talking about job security, and we're talking about you know a structure that's been built up, an administrative structure that's been built up, and and people want to maintain. We can't afford it, and Johnson's trying to do the thing that I think. Um, that, that that is his mission, which is to have a good, solid university uh, with within the dollars that uh, that he's going to be given. This discussion that I had with this university employee who has just recently left the university after, like I said, fifteen years, uh, was basically just again kind of this incredulity on the the amount of infighting over this, and the fact that they are all working at cross purposes trying to submarine this whole deal. Uh, with Jim Johnson kind of ramrodding the whole organization, and these uh, and these uh, you know these three factions just fighting it out with each other, uh, they were uncertain as to whether or not uh, that you know Johnson would be able to prevail in this situation because it is such a strenuous and arduous fight between these chancellors and their whole cadres. Yeah, the the problem is the board. I mean, so the board really hasn't had to do much over the decades leading up to this and as a consequence we don't have a really strong board of regents we've got we've got people who sort of wanted to put it on their resume uh didn't think they had to do much with it uh and uh, and and have sort of now it's not every board member there's some strong board members but but generally speaking we've got a board that's not real strong so johnson's out there sort of alone um he's got a board that that gets wishy-washy on him um, and and so he's out there trying to you know deal with his mandate of having a strong university with within the dollars given him, uh, and he's sort of out there alone doing it. Everybody else is going off on some other direction, and the board's not doing a great job of backing Johnson uh, backing Johnson up right now. Right, absolutely. Wrapping things up here, Brad. Uh, final thoughts, uh, thirty seconds. Well, I, I, I going back to the PFD. I think we need to. I need, we, we need to become realistic about what's going to happen, what's achievable uh, in the state of Alaska. I don't think cuts only is going to be achievable. We need to start wrapping our brain around that and what that means going forward. And I think it means coming up with a different way for Alaskans to contribute uh, uh, to government. Uh, we're going to have to do that, but a different way than PFD cuts, which just shoves the responsibility down on middle and lower income Alaska families. Brad Keithley, Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets. I've got links up on the Facebook page. You can check it out there or just check him out on Facebook. Brad, thank you so much. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.